ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ನಾವು ಕೆಲವು ದಿನಗಳ ಹಿಂದೆ ಅ ಫ್ಯೂ ಡೇಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹೋ ವಿ ರೆಕಾರ್ಡೆಡ್ ಅ ವಿಡಿಯೋ ವಿತ್ ದಿಸ್ ಲೇಡಿ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಗೋವಾ ಹೋಸ್ ವಿಡಿಯೋ ಹೆಡ್ ಆನ್ ವೈರಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಶಿ ಹೆಡ್ ಸ್ಪೋಕನ್ ಡೈರೆಕ್ಟ್ಲಿ ಟು ದಿ ಪ್ರೈಮ್ ಮಿನಿಸ್ಟರ್ ಆಸ್ಕಿಂಗ್ ಸಮ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸ್ಪೀಚಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ಆರ್ ಬಿಕಮ್ ಅ ಮೇಜರ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಕಂಟೆಕ್ಷನ್ ವೇರಿಯಸ್ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕೋರ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಆಪೋಸಿಷನ್ has written to the ECI, the Civil Society has written to the ECI about these, these speeches. Um, but uh, what has happened unfortunately is that uh, he has not stopped his speeches. In fact, he has taken it up uh, by many notches. And what we also noticed is that uh, the Bajra is now, uh, has company and uh, even the Pains, the, the Buffalo will not be spared, the Buffalo will be taken and given away. and uh, that uh, even the cricket team uh, will be judged on the basis of religion etc etc things that uh, everyone concurs did not happen in the 70 years uh, when the current opposition was the ruling party so there is no basis however either in the INC manifesto or anywhere for any such uh, wealth distribution either Bajra or the Bajra but uh, here we are today because many journalists are wondering uh, what is going on and uh, like uh, last time uh, dev sorbhi you know she is here uh, pointed out that uh, very clearly uh, one is it is anti constitutional for anyone including the highest authority to be making these allegations baseless allegations and also importantly why is it that the prime minister is so talking about his achievements over 10 years and seeking votes why is he attacking the opposition manifesto and why is it that uh, every speech of his seems to be revolving only around the INC manifesto and in the process uh, he is also cooking up things that are not even there in the manifesto and these are things that uh, uh, Dev Surabhi and Dev Surabhi pointed out in that last week. Now uh, Sujit Nair uh, has made a review where he talks about 10 different points uh, based on which he feels that BJP is cornered and therefore uh, that's probably one reason why uh, this kind of uh, you know, panic has set in and uh, why he's making these very wild and baseless allegations against the opposition and in the process also dog whistling at a particular community uh, minorities in general and the Muslims in particular and uh, this is very unfortunate our media as usual uh, is not interested Uh, ECI doesn't seem interested though they have sent a notice to Nataji as pointed out last time and uh, courts have said we can't micromanage ECI's day to day affairs which is factually correct and if ECI is an autonomous body and uh, their job uh, as in the MCC starts by saying that you cannot use any particular uh, reason or any any uh, community targeted way either on the basis of region, religion or linguistic basis yet here we are we are noticing that uh, unfortunately none other than the Prime Minister himself is going on with this. So let's begin one by one. One is with the uh, why is this happening, uh, this continuous uh, thing and uh, let's understand from uh, Dev Surabhi uh, what does she think and uh, why, is, why is this uh, non-stop attack on uh, one on minority and uh, then the uh, INC manifesto. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, this, uh, this constant onslaught of uh, attacks on the minorities uh, and then also on the INC manifesto um, uh, very clearly uh, underlines the fact that this uh, ruling government, despite them having been in power for 10 years, they don't have any uh, points to talk about or anything worthwhile as an achievement to talk about. Uh, hence, they uh, only have this on, agenda, uh, on their agenda that they want to divide the people and they also want to attack the opposition. Uh, as also can be seen as a phenomenon under this regime, uh, that the Godi media also has very clearly uh, made the opposition its uh, enemy and keeps attacking the opposition at the behest of the Prime Minister. So, the entire machinery uh, that you know, the BJP is using against the opposition, uh, day by day, it, it's speaking volumes about how desperate this uh, regime has become. And uh, the more shrill 
uh, his speeches have become uh, every day. Uh, we can see the growing desperation. Uh, first it was Bajra, then it was Bhais, and now it is you know the cricket team. Uh, he seems to be trying to find uh, any point which is emotionally evocative and trying to make it stick among the people that this is what is going to be used against you. Whereas if you look at the, <coughs> the Congress manifesto, uh, I hope uh, a lot of the viewers would have downloaded it by now, thanks to Modi Thanks to Modi <laughs> So, <laughs> if you go through the entire manifesto, it's it's just speaking about uh, justice. It's about delivering justice to the people, which is based on our very constitution that uh, anybody who is downtrodden, who has not gotten access to resources, who needs support from the state, because of course uh, we are a socialist country, which these people seem to forget. <laughs> uh, so the entire manifesto is talking about delivering justice to different stakeholders in our country uh, who have not received the resources over time. So all this is uh, extremely baseless and uh, as, I write, as I said before that uh, they don't have any other topic to really talk about. Uh, his uh, Sabka Vikas, that line went out into the cold uh, storage. Then uh, Vishwa Guru went into cold storage. <laughs> then <laughs> So many of his slogans have gone into cold stories because nothing is sticking. Like we can see uh, the horrible repercussions of their destructive policies, uh, and various reports have come out that you know uh, most of the budgets are spent on advertisements. Um, the actual outlay of funds or the disbursement of funds for uh, say farmers or anybody else that is actually just. <laughs> It's in cold storage, it's, it's only on paper that it is being spent, but it's uh, actually not reaching the people at all. So this is my view on what's happening right now. Uh, somehow the, uh, even the foreign media has taken note of this and uh, they are looking at uh, uh, the use of politics uh, coming from the highest uh, constitutional authority, which is a very serious thing. And, uh, and then looking at uh, whether India whose record apparently in terms of human rights and uh, various things is already on the lowest, whether it's the Press Freedom Index or any of the indexes, we are on the lowest ever. And uh, coming back to the points raised by uh, Sudhir Nair, uh, one is that of course it starts with inflation. The inflation seems to have uh, taken precedence over everything else, rightly so, because the price rises un heard of, I mean unprecedented and people are finding it very difficult the way the family savings have been wiped out today and people are working much more than uh, they used to work and yet they are finding it difficult to manage and the family debt has increased and of course the country's debt is also going through the roof and uh, unprecedented borrowing by the Indian government making every Indian practically born or otherwise uh, or, or, or in, in serious debt and uh, then comes the second one, I think, if I remember correctly, unemployment. So he has pointed out in that, of course, dictatorship is another factor, uh, which is which is also playing big time. Uh, arresting, chief, sitting chief ministers, and uh, uh, from the uh, chief ministers to the uh, civil society uh, activists, to the opposition, to uh, you know students, and of course the farmers. And you've seen horrendous crimes committed against farmers who are merely asking what the Prime Minister himself had promised last year, right? I mean, they were not asking for anything out of the world. And uh, the farmers from Tamil Nadu or uh, North India have been completely ignored and uh, insulted and uh, looked down. And then women's safety, which is another huge, huge issue, uh, which of course we've seen uh, untold crimes being committed by the functionaries of uh, BJP, their allies, uh, party men. I mean, it's, 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 it's very sad that something like this happens. On the other side, when Manipur is burning and uh, Manipur, uh, the women are brutalized, the Prime Minister does not even really get to speak, let alone visit this. And he's on a safari in, in Assam, which is right there. I mean, he doesn't care to go to Manipur. He's on a safari, sitting on an elephant and changing his costumes day in and day out. So, somewhere down, all of this and plus another important aspect that uh, 
he has raised is that the temple which was uh, you know just strategically opened uh, an unfinished temple which uh, the many hindu followers think that should have never been done apparently um, also has not gone on right so these are the things. now the surprise one which of course he has not spoken is that apparently in up one of the issues today is the effects of the vaccine which was uh, again another story in itself uh, in karnataka people like dr shrinivas kakala have been flagging the problems of vaccine in the way it was released its pricing which was another huge thing because a differential pricing was created when the company itself had admitted to a x price it was increased by multiple times and people were made to pay and then after certain interventions uh, it was told that okay everyone will get it free and then it was called modi vaccine and that modi was giving uh, you know uh, which is again unprecedented no prime minister i'm sure anywhere would claim when the government does what it is supposed to do as as uh, as his his giving and uh, at least they had said the bjp government would have been okay but now with the company accepting that there are very serious side effects and now of course so there is no talk of vaccine sort of right that has gone on not only just no talk of the vaccine the the photo of the prime minister from the vaccine certificate has disappeared overnight so that is the level of uh, you know this entire thing whether it is the vaccine issue whether it is any other issue this this government has uh, run on the modus operandi of taking credit for everything modi taking credit for everything but not taking responsibility for any of the uh, actions of theirs which have gone wrong so in the case of vaccines also uh, when they came out then they were you know like certificate pe modi ji ka photo they were calling it modi vaccine uh and and even after the <laughs> you know the expose on this vaccine recently uh, amit shah just like 2 3 days ago in uh, uttar pradesh uh he was trying to allay the fears of the people by saying ye to modi ka tika hai isse kuch bigadne nahi wala hai i mean the the extent of uh trying to escape from the responsibility of bad actions that you've taken Uh, at that point of time, it was the bound duty of the government to inform the people of the adverse effects of the vaccine, which they didn't do. Uh, supposedly, the 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 side effects were there in the packaging of the <laughs> vaccine, but the government is always responsible for making sure their citizens are first. The the the, the problem with this regime is that citizens don't come first. it's their their friends whether it is serum institute whether it is adani whether it is ambani whoever is their favorite or close to their heart or maybe you know because they killing their cash coffers <laughs> with their tempos uh <laughs> uh modi and his party his regime seems to always put his special friends first and this is like extremely despicable that you are sitting on the post of the prime minister you have been elected by the people of india right adani and ambani didn't elect you and put you there neither did the serum serum institute elect you and put you there it's the people right so your responsibility is first it was the people who put you in that position but this doesn't seem to register in their mind or maybe they don't want to acknowledge this fact that their answerability is firstly to the people and that is why we see and it really pains my heart today that people my age i'm 32 years old people my age younger than me healthy people who were exercising who were physically active healthy lifestyles and everything suddenly getting strokes and dying i have also heard from my own friends who have had children post covid after taking the vaccine there are severe deformities uh, in children who are being born after uh, covid vaccination drives have been done especially to parents who have taken the covid vaccine you know children being born with holes in their hearts uh, under developed lungs uh, issues with brain development things like that so i mean 
who is going to take responsibility for all of this correct you may you made the decision to bring in this vaccine you gave it to a friend of yours it was literally thopophied on the people that you have to do this you have to take it and collect electoral bonds from them collecting electoral bonds in the process from them and then you forgot about the people just as they forgot about the people when they were going through the oxygen crisis when they didn't have hospital beds a uh, complete abdication of responsibility that's what we see repeatedly with this regime yeah, sadly uh, those who pointed out uh, like i mentioned dr shivas patel or opposition leaders like uh, rahul gandhi were attacked you know for raising concerns and uh, government had abdicated its responsibility government was not forthcoming was not even willing to look at uh, there is anything wrong and listening to experts they were not doing that the opposition had to do it and they were attacking these people and calling them usual names you know? uh, that brings me to the next point you know uh, one of the things that uh, modi ji and his party must be credited is uh, uniting uh, opposition on one side and also uniting the civil society you know, today uh, you are a civil society activist and uh, you know this more than anyone that uh, civil society itself is is made up of different people different beliefs and ideologies in a country like us and that's very normal but they were united today with one common agenda of protecting the constitution and very clearly bringing down this regime and that is unprecedented and this has never happened before uh, except during freedom struggle so this is the extent of uh, uh, people's uh, you know will to bring the regime down and clearly uh, we are seeing a change there is a ground swell against uh, the regime and uh, all the talk uh, is disappearing i have not heard char so far in the last values <laughs> let's forget achhe din <coughs> sabka vikas or whatever and beti uh, padao no way you know so because immediately people think of prajwal uh, uh, rewarda uh, or resolution so these are these are things that are now heading at them uh, on one side and also the spectacular failure of uh, uh, the mandir politics you know and that doesn't seem to have caught on with people at all because people are really important in a lot of lot of issues today. and they're seeing the regimes inefficiency on one side inability to address any of these so uh, there is also an article by dr parakla on on the importance of civil society even post uh, uh, the uh, you know uh, june 4th when the when the county will be over and he is, he suspects that there will be weeks of uncertainty and where the civil society needs to continue to play this role and he is appreciated the role of civil society and he to point out that civil society must continue to play this role and knowing fully well the kind of things that we have witnessed in the last time and we have witnessed unprecedented uh, you know uh, horse trading and people openly you know destroying governments bringing down governments and proudly going to the press and uh, saying this you know uh, like in the case of maharashtra and so nothing is uh, nothing is that is uh, that can't be expected so what do you see the role of civil society uh, going forward um very clearly and i actually <laughs> the only thing that i thank this regime for is for uniting all of us indians you know who are majority actually because if you look at their vote share uh, as per the 2019 it's uh, 36.37% so it's 60 plus percent of indians that uh, you know they have <laughs> managed to unite uh, through their destructive policies so civil society especially and i am so happy uh, to see uh, our goa elections have just gone by uh, on the 7th um i know for a fact that uh, although there was the india alliance there is congress party i also have connections to the congress party but it was the civil society that was literally going home to home you know they have no connection with any party they are spending money from their own pockets they are going uh, putting fuel in their own cars or their own bikes and they are going door to door campaigning for 
the candidate that that clearly showcases that they have the capability of fighting the region. That was the India Alliance, the Congress candidates in Goa. And everywhere else, I have gotten reports from people where, you know, it's entirely unprecedented. And we used to think that, you know, to fight elections, you need so much money and this and that and the other. But this time we are seeing a completely different phenomenon. People are crowdfunding. People are raising money, spending their own money, bringing together money in between people and actually going around and campaigning against the BJP. And this is what Dr. Parakala Prabhakar had rightly pointed out even 3-4 months ago before the, uh, the voting began, before the MCC also came into it. Right? He had very rightly uh, predicted that the civil society, it, this time the election is not between the BJP and the opposition but it is BJP and Modi versus the people of India. And I am very happy to see that. And this, uh, I hope, I hope and I will also appeal to the people who are, uh, you know, part of civil society movements that do not become complacent the moment 4th June comes because our real work is actually going to become, begin after that. Uh, because looking at the signs and how uh, dictator, dictatorial this regime has been, um, in its very functioning in the past 10 years, you can be rest assured that this government, once they lose power, they're not going to go peacefully. It's not going to be a peaceful transfer of power as we have seen <laughs> before 2014. The UPA to transfer power to uh, Modi very easily. And it has always been a democratic process that once the mandate comes from the people, there's always a peaceful transfer of power. But this time around, it looks like that it's not going to be peaceful at all. So it is our duty as Indian citizens to uh, ensure that peace and harmony is maintained uh, in our country, that we stay united. Ahimsa ke raste. We have to adopt that approach and ensure that there is a peaceful transfer of power uh, to the next regime, whoever it may be. It is indeed heartening to see uh, in Goa, I am told uh, the Adivasi associations, 12 of them have come together and uh, on their own done whatever they can and in many places uh, perhaps even in Hanisti, uh, voting percentage uh, by making sure that uh, they travel all the way. Many of them working outside the state have come back to Goa uh, and these are really, really hard places. And in many states we have seen good cooperation, a decent cooperation between civil society and uh, the opposition parties. In many states, unfortunately, not seeing that. But I hope going forward, uh, there is a mechanism created, a standing mechanism to understand because civil society can actually bring the voices uh, of the people to the table. And sometimes, uh, if the parties are mistaken, it is good to hear this out. In fact, Bharat Jodi Yatra itself uh, is perhaps one of the biggest listening posts ever created, as, as, as one of the most populous countries. Uh, when someone walks across uh, the country, length and breadth, and listens to people. And so it is obvious that uh, the, the manifesto that uh, one sees, the International Congress manifesto, reflects the aspirations of the people and the demands of people. So in the absence of that is why we need uh, the uh, devious politics, which is happening on the other side, because you do not have anything to speak about. You do not have uh, the luxury of talking about your achievements. You do not have the luxury of presenting a vision and uh, all the slogans that uh, you gave us uh, have been trashed and you do not want to even mention about it. You do not want to talk about uh, the terrible implementation of the GST regime or your failure in the COVID or uh, you know, any of the things that, that, that are happening. So today it's become an embarrassment and therefore you are trying to talk this in the community and therefore you are trying to cover up by, uh, you know, uh, bringing in non-existent things like Ambeyans and Gajara and Karnos. So, lastly, uh, tell us about, uh, you know, how does one connect these dots in terms of, you know, what has been happening, one the civil society coming together, the opposition coming together, and uh, rightly so, because though, I think, Sikh sharing and, uh, and uh, alliance should never be mixed up, two separate things. Even where there is no Sikh sharing, uh, doesn't mean uh, parties are uh, the two different opposition parties are working against each other and that's not the case and that's what Nayak has pointed out, I agree with you. 
but that's never the case. Yeah, people are still working and for some reason they do not want to get into a single share attachment, which is fine. So June 4th, post June 4th, uh, and that alliance becomes a very relevant point in terms of, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's becomes the hope for the people who have come together now to work so hard. Right? So can we look at a, uh, one is of course you have the uh, Nyai Patra, you have different parties uh, within opposition, different manifestos, uh, bringing in a progressive agenda as, as a rallying point for the India, which, which is already there almost. And once you put that together on the table, one, it becomes easier for the electorate to understand what is the agenda of India Alliance, one. Uh, unlike on the other side, it's not about Bajra and Nets, but about, about <laughs> real, real issues and how does one address it? And how does one address uh, the concerns of the of the ones who have not got their share? It's all about justice is just that. And uh, so how do you think that should happen? I mean, uh, can that happen without the civil society? Should it be left to the uh, political parties within the India Alliance? How do you think it should happen? Well, first of all, I would like to point out uh, with a little bit of background that, um, you know, Bharati Janta Party was always known as a cardinal based uh, party uh, before 2014, uh, before the takeover of the personality cult of Modi. Uh, and within the last 10 years, you know, what Modi has managed to do is completely destroy the cardinals of Bharati Janta Party. Today, uh, the situation is that it's become extremely fragmented, extremely uh, problematic within the Bharatiya Janata Party. And any moment now, we are already seeing the signs of implosion in Goa and we are going to see it across the country. The point I'm trying to make is that, you know, when a kada based party like Bharatiya Janata Party has been destroyed, one of the biggest repercussions of that is that uh, they are no longer connected to the voice of the people. And the second thing that they don't even want to listen to the voice. The problem with Bharatiya Janata Party is, uh, and has been historically because of their ideology also, is that uh, it's always a one-way communication with them. It's about them, their ideology and furthering that agenda, rather than actually listening to the aspirations of the people and having a two-way communication, uh, whether it is with people, with civic society, whoever it may be. Uh, they don't believe in listening. Contrast, contrast to that, look at the opposition. The, when Bharat Jodo Yatra happened, the Bharat Jodo Nyaya Yatra happened, uh, the other parties who were part of the alliance. Uh, all we've been doing is listening to the people. Yeah? And, and very, very beautifully, with a lot of happiness and zeal in our hearts, we, we've gone to the people, we've heard them. Uh, and the manifesto of the Congress itself is a, is a beautiful expression of the aspirations of the people. So, fundamentally, that is what is scaring Modi and this regime, is that in the process of destroying their own party through a personality cult, they even lost the avenue of listening to the people. Whereas the opposition has spent all its time, resources and everything to listen to the people and consult civic society in the process. Um, and I hope this culture, the new, uh, you know, this new dynamic in politics continues for times to come because this is the very basis of our democracy. That every voice is heard, whether it is the smallest voice or the biggest voice. Especially the smallest voice has to be heard because they don't have the avenue of getting heard uh, very easily. So. Civic society going forward is surely going to play uh, a very big role uh, in how politics is carried out. This uh, this time it has become very clear that civic society going forward is going to be a very essential part of uh, political planning, manifesto planning, uh, whatever has to be in the agenda of any polit political party. Civic society cannot be ignored anymore. That's uh, I, and again I thank Modi. <laughs> <laughs> the BJP for this because uh, because of them the other parties have woken up you know uh, of course uh, Congress party has been an Andolan Kari party always so it's always been about people and discussions and things like that but the whole process has become so streamlined thanks to uh, Narendra Modi and Bharti Janata Party so uh, I do believe that um, the the 
the manifesto of the Congress Party and the Alliance Partners. Um, it's, it's a beautiful expression of the people's voice. And um, again, I will reiterate that is what is giving sleepless nights to Narendra Modi and Bharatiya Janata Party because uh, the manifesto is actually resonating with the people. It is. It has become a voice of the people. People are seeing that, you know, this is my aspiration, this is what I want for myself. And I am seeing this in a party's manifesto. So that is what is really scaring them so badly. That because in contrast, if you look at the Bharti Janta Party manifesto, it looks like a very simplistic photo story of Modi ji. Well, it looks more like a portfolio shoot of his, with every page having a very elaborate and, <laughs> you know, a uh, very well-groomed photo of his. Uh, whereas the, <laughs> the points of the manifesto are actually taking a back seat. They are, they are nowhere reflecting the will of the people. So, see, that's the contrast. That's scary. Right? Here on one side you have the narcissistic personality cult of a document <laughs> and here is the expression of the aspiration so that's that's the point that I wanted to make. Uh, thank you Dev Sarvi, uh, you and Shiji for joining us once again and uh, we hope uh, to see the civil society and activists like you uh, taking the centre stage going forward and also uh, wishing the India Alliance the very best and we hope uh, that they do better than expected and actually uh, stop the destruction from happening. Thank you so much.